thank you so much. For, thank you so much for joining the EV working group meeting on the last day of September. Um, we have a short meeting here to give some subcommittee updates. Um, but before we begin, I will um, just mention that this meeting is being recorded and will be uh, published on the EV working group page within driveelectric.gov. If you do not wish to have your voice recorded, please do not speak during the call. If you do not wish to have your image recorded, please turn off your camera or participate by phone. If you speak during the call or use a video connection, you are presumed to consent to recording and use of your voice or image. Uh, with that disclaimer out of the way, um, we are here today with uh, two great leaders um, in the electrification space, Acting Administrator of FHWA, Kristen White, and Executive Director Gabe Klein of the Joint Office. So I will pass it to Kristen and stop sharing my slides here just to give us some up um, opening remarks, and then uh, Gabe will go second. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you to all of you. Uh, the real leaders are all in group members, and to you, the members of the public that are tuning in to help us understand how we can electrify America and build a strategic national charging network that meets our net zero goals and our goals of 500,000 chargers by 2030, which the news tells us we are right on track. You know, I am acting administrator of the Federal Highway Administration. I work very closely with Rachel, my colleague Gabe Klein, as the director of the Joint Energy and Office and Transportation. And you've heard from my colleagues before, but I just want to take a moment and celebrate all the success because last week was Climate Week. Many of us may have seen events, participated in events from New York to Austin to Detroit. And one of the things we talked about is we really need to take a moment that with your leadership, both in the public and private sectors, we have significantly accelerated the National Electric Vehicle Program in America since even it was incepted in 2021. We have doubled the number of chargers in America, which we announced in August. We are electrifying 80,000 miles of interstate systems. We have 52 states and territories that have teams and plans and programs ready to go. And in fact, we just announced this last week to our colleagues at the White House that 34% of the grants through our charging and fueling infrastructure initiative and EVC RAW, known as the NEVI 10% program, are already underway. So this is a credit to the hardworking staff of the joint office, both at DOE and the Department of Transportation, but also to all of you that are taking advantage of these significant funding opportunities and helping us with these policy priorities. One of the things that I really wanted to make sure we hit on is policy is still crucial as we build out and evolve this network. So for those of you in the medium duty, heavy duty space, I sure hope you are aware of the medium duty, heavy duty request for information or RFI that is published and open for your comment and advice and feedback on how we build out the national network for our friends in the fleets, buses and medium duty, heavy duty markets. That RFI is open until November 12th. So you still have a lot of time and we really need your feedback and ideas on how to make this network and this NEVI program work for you. Uh, the last thing I want to thank is that I really just want to take a moment. You all have been taking time very regularly to come together here since the start of the Biden-Harris administration's commitment to our half a million charger goal by 2030 and the NEVI program. And I think I just want to thank you all individually, your organizations, your teams, and the networks that you're building, both relationally and across organizations. I think that's really a celebration of these types of working groups. And I want to thank Rachel and the joint office team and the staff that have been really, really making this work. So with that, I want to encourage you Make sure you are listening and engaged actively. We want to hear your feedback. For the members of the public, we want you to participate. So we know this is going to be a great conversation. And it couldn't be without my colleague, Gabe Klein, who I'm going to turn it over in the Joint Office of Energy and Transportation. Hey, Gabe. Hey, thank you, Kristen. Um, and we're happy to welcome you to the EV Working Group team. We really appreciate your leadership and participation. And um, Kristen and the Federal Highways team are invaluable uh, partners, uh, primary partners in getting all of this done. Um, I actually want to take a second, you know, we're, we're so focused sometimes uh, in our office on what's happening within the federal government, um, but there's a lot happening out there uh, beyond what we're doing. A um, couple little notes. One is we just saw numbers for, uh, uh, I believe it was uh, August, uh, EV sales, because this is not just this working group is not just about EV charging, it's about EVs as well. 
And uh, once again, went back up over 10% uh, for sales of EVs, which is awesome. Um, and uh, also, I, I saw a really interesting report that was recently published uh, by MIT. It reminded me of my city DOT days putting in bike share stations where initially retailers were like, oh, I don't know if I want that thing near me near my store, my location. And then once they saw the data and how much increased sales they could get by having a bike share station near them, they wanted them. Well, we're seeing the same thing with EV charging. Uh, this MIT study, and, and I'll put it in the, in the chat after if it's not in there already, uh, found that uh, EV charging boosted spending at nearby businesses to the tune of thousands of extra dollars annually. Um, and this increase was, quote, particularly pronounced for businesses in under-resourced areas. So it's bigger than just the propulsion system in our vehicles. Uh, it's about, you know, it's good for people, it's good for the environment, and it's good business, even if you're just adjacent uh, to it. And so investing in charging in communities, and we're rapidly moving into more uh, a community based charging as well with the with the CFI grants and EBC raw, it can help create jobs, and then grow the local economies, particularly for disadvantaged folks and small businesses. Um, I also want to note the joint office has also kicked off uh, seven EV charging workforce development projects totaling almost $10 million and that's across Oregon, Alabama, Pennsylvania, California, Wisconsin, uh, this uh, DC Baltimore area where I am, and Virginia. And this is to support the more than 5 million EVs that have sold uh, cumulatively in the US to date. Um, and that just shows that more and more driving an EV is a daily reality for millions of people and growing. But we also know there's still a ton of work to do. There's really important work to be done to fill gaps along highways, uh, substantially grow community level two charging so that people can charge where they park and when their cars are sitting. And we know that they sit on average 95% of the time. So that level two charging that we're getting into now uh, is going to be the workhorse of our national charging network. So in summary, we've come a long way, but there's still more to do. Uh, we really value this collaborative effort as we collaborate, and, and that's our job in the joint office to collaborate across federal government, particularly with DOT and DOE, but even beyond with EPA and so forth. Um, we want to collaborate with you. We look forward to hearing um, uh, you know, your recommendations so we can incorporate those. And uh, as Kristen said, you know, thank you so much for your time, your contributions, and um, I hope the meeting is uh, informative and productive for you all as it will be uh, for me and our team. And I'm going to pass it back to Rachel. And thank you, Rachel, also for all of your efforts here as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much to, to Gabe and Kristen for taking time out of your busy days to, uh, to kick us off. Uh, it's really great to have you here. Um, and we will go ahead and get into business. Um, all right, I will pass it over quick to uh, Rachel Sack, our facilitator today, to go over ground rules. Great. Thanks, Rachel. And thank you for those great welcoming remarks. Hi, everyone. My name is Rachel Sack. I'm with the Volpe Center, and I'll be your facilitator today during this short meeting, which is really intended to um, allow us to have updates from our working group members and some discussion as we plan for our next steps and the future. Um, I did want to just note that there are a few links put in the chat uh, based on the comments that you just heard. So if you haven't wandered over to the chat just to see those, um, those links are there for you. Uh, just a few logistics as we get started. Uh, for our members, as we have our discussion, please raise your hand and I'll be happy to call on you um, so we can hear comments from everyone. Uh, please mute when you're not talking and you can turn your video on when you are speaking, but just to help ensure our everyone's connections are strong, we ask that you stay off video if you're not talking. And for members of the public who are joining us, uh, you are muted. Uh, but you'll be able to chat with the host if you do have an issue. 
Um, during the public comment period, towards the end of our meeting, you will be given the ability to unmute uh, when called upon. So we will uh, review those uh, steps when we get closer. So meanwhile, before we dive in, just a quick um, recap of what is on our agenda for today. Uh, we're going to turn it over back to Rachel Mueller shortly, who's going to give us just an overview of some of the activities lined up for, to take us through the remainder of this calendar year. And then today, the majority of our time is to hear from our subcommittees. So we'll have time uh, to hear some presentations from our three subcommittees with some discussion amongst the working group members. And then we'll turn it over to our public comment period to round out the discussion uh, before talking about our next meeting for this calendar year and some of the next steps and actions our working group members will be taking. Um, so thanks again, look forward to our discussion. And Rachel, I'll turn it back to you to talk about um, this, the calendar year activities. Great, thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, we have been working across uh, subcommittees here to um, come up with a little bit of a timeline, give us some structure of how we kind of get to the end of the calendar year um, and really produce some valuable results, um, some recommendations from the EV working group to really take all of our ideas and thoughts uh, over the last number of meetings and turn them into uh, actionable recommendations uh, that the federal government and industry can work on together. So this is just kind of a high level review of the timeline to get us to the end of the calendar year. Um, we have in September, um, I know many of you have been meeting across subcommittees to develop content for recommendations and really formulate ideas around the priorities that we initially set out for the EV working group. So the subcommittees uh, for those uh, maybe new to the, to the meeting here are uh, grid integration, medium and heavy duty electrification and the EV charging network. And so those subcommittees have been working together to formulate ideas and recommendations. Um, and now we're at a point where we wanna get those recommendations out to in the public sphere. So the EV working group staff have, have already provided some examples and templates for those recommendations. The goal here today is to get a little bit of a progress up, update and talk about this timeline um, through the end of the year so that we're all um, uh, ball, shooting for the same goals. So uh, next month, which is just tomorrow, can you believe it's already October, uh, we are intending to have the subcommittees kind of put forth a number of recommendations that then the EV working group staff will kind of compile and then the full membership will begin review. In November, we want the full membership to continue that review and also start commenting on the recommendations. Once we get all the comments back from the full membership, then we will have uh, the EV working group staff kind of compile all those comments and identify where we see alignment in uh, putting out public recommendations. And then we'll bring those, uh, those recommendations, that package of recommendations to the full membership uh, to do a series of short public meetings uh, where we will discuss each one of those recommendations and vote on the approval. We do need majority vote to uh, approve a recommendation uh, but we are also able to kind of record a, a minority opinion um, if, if there are some folks that uh, disagree with the recommendation. The goal here, though, is to try to get to as many substantive recommendations as possible uh, across the, the various perspectives, the 25 different members uh, pulling together uh, those recommendations that we think we all need to move uh, to, to uh, follow with actions to really um, support the electrification trans transformation. So then in December, those approved recommendations by the EV working group that again will be done all through uh, public uh, meetings will then go through an internal process where we will just uh, you know do any copy editing, um, get the approvals from the chairs, our secretaries of transportation and energy, um, get the approval to put on our, our website, um, and then those recommendations become published on the website. Um, we do have a process that will start then after that of uh, sub 
bringing the uh, the recommendations that didn't either make it to approvals or didn't get uh, put in that first recommendation package, the subcommittees can then start reviewing um, how they might want to uh, to revise those in order to get them to something that the full working group membership can uh, approve. Uh, but then we will make sure that uh, we are following up with actions and steps for the recommendations that do get approved and having the members amplify those recommendations. So we are really getting it out to our full network and can work together as a public and private industry um, to uh, realize the goals of electrification. So that is our ambitious timeline. And uh, with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to the subcommittee updates because I think that's what most folks are here and excited to listen to. Great. So we are going to uh, start with grid integration. Oh, Rachel, I don't know if I'm the only one that can't hear you, but I can't hear you. I can hear you, Rachel. Okay. I can hear. Okay, um, let's hope that things will cooperate. Uh, we're going to start with grid integration, then move on to medium and heavy duty, and then charging networks. Um, so Nadia, I have you as our uh, first um, subcommittee to, to give an overview. Would you like to come on camera and um, provide an update to the group? Sure. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Good afternoon, everyone. So. Uh, the other Rachel, thank you for laying out our roadmap through the rest of the year. We're excited to be digging in with the objective of presenting recommendations that will ultimately hopefully be adopted by the full EV working group. We have come up with about 10 areas of focus, but wanted to start with two that uh, do bear some relationship. And the first is we know that the grid is the backbone. Uh, literally in many situations for this electrification evolution. And so we want to proactively uh, lean into recommendation, a recommendation around how the federal government, uh, the utilities and other stakeholders can collaborate to have some sort of backstop or guarantee around proactive build out of the grid. So in partnership with industry, we know where many uh, areas of concentration will be, uh, for example, with medium and heavy duty trucking. So how do we um, address grid upgrades? Well, of course, respecting the state processes that are in place, but um, allowing uh, industry to be a little bit more nimble and start to build out are areas that we know we will need uh, to one, and again, this is in process, it's not final and it's subject to change, but this is uh, the first area that we have identified to lean in and, and come forth with a recommendation. The second is managed charging, and I say it's related because obviously um, the more that we can uh, think about and ensure that we're uh, putting the foundation in place to support managed charging, that uh, impacts the utilization of the existing grid and uh, the need for future investment. So we have also been exploring a collaborative stakeholder effort that would be led by DOE uh, to develop standard data requirements and exchange of information among the key part parties and entities that need to support managed charging. And of course, that's uh, that's a various, uh, a handful of, of entities at least. So with that, I will note that um, we have seen the other uh, subcommittee focus areas and, and also identified those. So I think what's nice here is today, as you uh, hear from the other subcommittees, you will see that I think that we really try to um, be thoughtful in bifurcating and dividing up the focus areas. And we think all of them will be uh, essential to helping to continue the momentum that was highlighted at the beginning of our discussion today. So with that, I will pause and see if there are any questions. Great, does anyone have any questions so far for the grid integration group? Laura. 
Hi, all. Um, not a question. Sorry, I'm trying to get my video on. Um, not a question per se, Nadia. I appreciate that. Uh, but I, a request as managed charging as that moves forward, I'd love for, I'd love to be a part of that. Um, because I think that is absolutely critical and it ties into a lot of the work that we do on the technology side. So I'd love to be a part of that. Absolutely. We will, we would be happy to have you join. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, great. Thanks, Nadia. And after we hear from all three subcommittees, we hope to open it up for a more lively discussion just to encourage more of that cross collaboration that has already been happening, but that can take us further into the year. Um, great. So we are going to move on to our next subcommittee, the medium and heavy duty group. And I believe Mike is going to share some updates for this group. Yeah. Hello, everybody. So um, standing in today for Dean Bushy. Dean, um, uh, as we might have known since we've been together, he took over the leadership of this uh, medium and heavy duty subcommittee. And so Dean is leading it. Um, update on Dean, he lives near Asheville, North Carolina, and was pretty heavily affected by the hurricane that came through. Um, basically, let us know he's without water and electricity, and uh, the roads are uh, pretty pretty beat up in the uh, mountain area he lives. He was able to get out and get back, but um, Dean's dealing with that, so uh, we said we'd take over uh, working on this uh, and presenting our findings from this subcommittee. So. Uh, we've been working on uh, the medium duty and heavy duty electric vehicle, uh, you know, kind of the uniqueness that our industry brings to the electric vehicle uh, adoption and challenges. So, um, you know, that's that's interesting and kind of difficult because, you know, we don't want to, uh, obviously we need vehicle integration, we need infrastructure for charging and so forth. So that's where this this collaboration between the different subcommittees really come together. So with the focus on what makes these vehicles adoption unique, uh, we created a, a number of uh, recommendations, a, a list, if you will, and, and looked at various different things. And um, these are the two that we're proposing today. Uh, the first one's really around uh, education of the unique pieces that, um, uh, that the industry brings. So the recommendation is that the federal government and industry provide education on the unique needs of electrifying medium and heavy duty vehicles. Uh, this is things like myth busting and sharing some of the unknown facts and realities of uh, commercial vehicle electrification. So um, this just continues to uh, show up in the work that um, we do on electrifying where, uh, you know, there's just a, like misunderstandings um, uh, of, of different pieces to uh, the things that need to, to fall in place, just like basic understanding of how these trucks operate, where those um, operations can be modified for um, electric vehicles and where maybe they won't. Um, so a lot of just uh, good education before action uh, is needed and, and uh, is the essence of this first recommendation. Um, the second one is around uh, detailing the use cases that are best suited for electrification to expedite waves of adoption. So what we mean by here is really looking at the entire industry of medium and heavy duty vehicles, trucks, buses, et cetera, and um, uh, detail uh, how those vehicles are used uh, today. And um, knowing again that those operations might be modified a little bit, but basically here's how the business of moving freight, the business of moving people, um, service industries and so forth. So uh, with the goal though, of looking at those detailed use cases and then determining which ones are ripe earlier and later for uh, electrification. Uh, and we think this is really important and we keep coming back to this as a subcommittee, this, this segmentation, which will help us then uh, uh, better understand when I say us, I mean, you know, everyone working on um, commercial vehicle electrification for things like analyses and understanding around total cost of ownership and sort of well to wheels calculations. I mean, you can't do those calculations and understand the effects of electrification, you know, if you don't have the market segmentation. Uh, you know, I always think about uh, a garbage truck starts and stops 800 times a day. 
a long haul truck might stop twice a day. Uh, and you start to think about how that affects things of, of these calculations. So these, here's our two recommendations from the medium and heavy duty subcommittee. Thank you. Anyone have comments or questions for this subcommittee? Nadia. Really appreciate the recommendations, Mike. And I think that when we get to the next uh, subcommittee's recommendations, also getting to the essence of sharing the different use cases that you noted and making that part of our public education campaign, I think will be very beneficial because uh, at first glance, I don't think that most people really understand the intricacies, at least I didn't until you all ha had educated me, of what is, you know, all the various and numerous ways that trucks can be used uh, in our economy. So I think it's a, a great tie-in and, and segue into the next um, subcommittee, but just wanted to note that I think this could be a good area for public uh, awareness and education. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? And I will just note for our public that's listening in, um, your opportunity to comment will be during our public comment period. Um, so the discussion right now is for working group members only. Um, Andrew? Yeah, let me turn my camera on. I just want to, I wanted to echo what Nadia just said and commend the subcommittee on draft recommendation two in particular. I think segmenting is absolutely the way to go. We have to crawl before we walk and walk before we run and being realistic about the fact that there are different um, use cases and different cycles um, in the heavy duty uh, arena. I think, I think a lot of it applies to the light duty arena as well. If we're smart about it and we know which is the next cohort of users that is likely uh, to, to embrace the technology will we'll accelerate the adoption. Um, and I think we across the across the government and across the private sector, we have to be really smart about this stuff. And so I really commend them on the uh, recommendation. That's it. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, Andrew, I'm going to assume the hand is from your previous comment. Um, but great. Okay. Excellent. All right. So John, I'm going to hand it over to you so we can hear from the charging networks subcommittee. Great. Thanks. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so first, um, uh, I want to thank, uh, my, uh, uh, fellow subcommittee chairs, Nadia and Dean and Mike. Um, there's been a lot of uh, opportunity for us to compare notes and 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 collaborate through the process, and I think all of these recommendations are better for it. Uh, and as we continue to refine these and look forward to others, I know that there is uh, additional work that we're going to be able to do together. So, so thanks for that. Um, also, secondly, um, this particular subcommittee focused on the charging network has been particularly active and focused. Uh, and um, and I want to you know commend all of the members of the subcommittee for being at the meetings, for providing input and perspective that's really helped shape uh, the two uh, recommendations that we're going to uh, summarize for the full full committee. So uh, what we're what we did as a subcommittee is we started with the customer, and we worked our way backwards, and so. By customer in this case, we mean the men and women who are buying, leasing, and using um, EVs. Uh, and we're trying to understand how to make sure that that experience is an experience that is positive um, and that is an experience that reinforces um, the, the cutting edge nature of, of these types of vehicles and this type of experience. Uh, and so what we did was um, we wanted to focus um, both our area, uh, both our recommendations on the customer. So the first recommendation that we are presenting to the full committee is 
actually a public education and awareness campaign. This would be, um, as we are thinking about it and presenting it to the full committee, is an opportunity for collaboration between uh, the government and the private sectors to build awareness about the technology and notably how it works at a particular point uh, in the process. And that is how, when, where, uh, and how much do I charge my vehicle? Uh, and so that's really the focal point. We think as uh, Nadia referenced this as well, as did Mike, we think um, this could be the first step in an opportunity for us to work collaboratively on other aspects of public education in the EV space broadly. But we focused here on the charging experience for a couple of reasons. One, when you talk to uh, certainly light duty customers and intenders to buy or lease an EV, what we hear are two questions. How far does this thing go on a charge and where do we charge it? And so, and then within those questions, how does it work? How do I charge it? Where do I charge it? Those types of things. And so the focus of this first recommendation is, and literally imagine a, a PSA, a public, a short, crisp public awareness campaign message that could be used by uh, various partners. Uh, it could be at... Uh, vehicle rental counters. It could be at uh, automotive dealerships. It could be at service stations. It could be at fleet operators. The opportunity for people to see in a creative, sharp way um, how easy it is at, to charge a vehicle and what the fundamental process is. Um, one last point I'd make before I go on to the second recommendation is that we have seen these types of public-private collaborations on important uh, public education and awareness work in the past. Uh, one that, that is certainly familiar to those of you who are uh, been around the automotive safety space is the idea of the click it or ticket campaign and the airbag and seatbelt safety campaign coming together uh, to promote the use of seat belts and the recognition of the importance of uh, uh, crashworthiness technology. So that is our first uh, recommendation. Our second recommendation looked again from a customer's point of view at the experience of charging. Um, and what we have found, uh, those of us who are EV uh, owners uh, and also through looking at various uh, survey research, is that the charging experience from a customer facing point of view is not perfect every time. Uh, and so we recognize that one of the key aspects of accelerating EV acceptance uh, and utilization is going to be to make sure the charging experience is a customer friendly, reliable, robust experience every time. Um, we started this conversation by looking at requirements that are built into the NEVI program. Um, that program, funded by government resources, of course, has minimum standards. And we debated whether uh, there ought to be standards, uh, uh, meaning a stick, or whether there ought to be incentives, meaning a carrot. And so what we've, what we've come up with is the idea of a race to the top, a rating system for all publicly available charging uh, uh, points. And so the idea would be that a charging point that has uh, uh, meets standards, customer facing standards, similar to what you see in the NEVI program, for example, um, high levels of up uptime, 97, 98% of uptime, multiple uh, payment, uh, payments accepted, well lit, et cetera, um, would be rated more highly than stations that don't meet those standards. And the idea would be similar to what we see at the Department of Transportation's new car assessment program, NCAP, known affectionately as car, Stars on Cars, or for example, the EPA's Energy Star Rating uh, Program. So uh, again, more detail needs to be developed in both of these recommendations, but these are our recommendations we think start with a focus on the customer and address 
uh, key concerns and opportunities to educate and to uh, improve the experience of these EV customers today. Thank you, John. Anyone have comments or questions on these two draft recommendations? And as we think about all six together, I'm just curious if there are any connections people are making or you know, larger uh, approaches that can include some of these diff unique aspects, but certainly with the same goals in mind. Uh, Michael, you may be muted. Sorry there. Michael Barabee here from DOE. Um, I, I wanted to comment uh, specifically, John, on the last few, but also use that as an example. Well, I think those are both really strong and really good. I think as we are developing these recommendations collectively, um, to the degree that they can be, you know, kind of as as clear and actionable, and, and but with, like with some meat at the same, like meat to them, I think uh, is really what's called for here. And I think those those last few kind of are good examples. They're kind of pretty specific, pretty clear, but they'd be like a very tangible thing that would, you know, kind of in and of itself move the needle forward in some way on the the EV uh, EV market space. So. As I'm thinking to myself about all the recommendations, I know we shared six examples here today, and, and I know some of the teams have a few others that weren't quite maybe ready that they're kind of percolating on, but to the degree that we can do that, I think that will be, um, you know, well received. John, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I just wanted to, um... Um, come back, Rachel, to the question you had asked about just a minute ago about some of the cross currents or connections between the various recommendations. And I just want to highlight one that I think uh, is important between the work that Nadia and the grid readiness group is doing and the and the charging infrastructure. Um, I really I really uh, uh, love the managed charging aspect of this. You know, what we were just talking about in our charging infrastructure group, of course, is charging outside the home. Charging inside the home is still a majority experience for light duty EV owners, right? Um, you know, um, I, I won't quibble with the data. You have the data, whether it's 80 or 85 percent of EV uh, owners right now are charging at home. Um, I think that um, we would love to continue to dialogue with Nadia and the group about what specific sort of recommendations we can put together between the work that the utilities and the PUCs and PSCs are doing and the work that the automotive industry is doing um, to add bi-directional capability to vehicles and see if we can identify specific win-wins. So a way that a customer with that vehicle, with that technology gets a, a benefit um, from charging at home and how a rate payer uh, would also benefit from um, the uh, effects of managed charging and bi-directional technology um, on the rate base. And so, you know, I, I just I love the work that Nadia and the team are doing, and I, and I think I, I want to make sure that we're adding the that that automotive technology perspective to it. Thank you. Great. Uh, Rakesh. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, I'm not able to get my video on for some reason, but just wanted to make a couple of quick comments. Um, we saw a recommendation on the charging network side with respect to public education and awareness. And on the medium and heavy duty side, we had uh, something along the lines of myth busting. So there could be some synergies in these two recommendations and work areas. Uh, of course, the demographic uh, that we are trying to reach with respect to passenger car vehicles versus medium and heavy duty vehicles is very different. The way those vehicles get charged is very different as well. So there could be some obvious uh, similarities as well as contrasts in these two areas and it will behoove us to have these two uh, working groups uh, 
collaborate close together so that we can deal with the similarities as well as the contrast related to these two recommendations. Thank you. Great. Are there any other um, suggestions or ties or questions for each other um, as we're here together? Because hopefully this is a space that's going to um, help you continue to build your ideas into more of that deliverable aspect that Rachel talked about at the onset. So does anyone else have anything they'd like to add to the discussion? That maybe has, has or has not yet come up in your individual subcommittee groups and would benefit uh, the larger group here. Anything else to add from anyone? Rachel, I'll also just open it up to if anyone has any process questions as well. I know we didn't take a lot of time um, between the timeline and the, or maybe that was just when my audio went out. Um, but if there are any questions on the process as well, happy to take those. John, you have your hand raised. Uh, yes, um, just uh, um, to to your again your question about things we can be doing to work together. I I do, you know, we have had conversations at past um, meetings, and and you can see it within the recommendations that we, we're discussing today. The importance of having metrics or key performance indicators that um, identify the track we're on, right? Like, the, and the progress we're making um, or where we need to focus more uh, to continue to make progress. Um, and I just want to note that, that, you know, there's, you know, there, th that work is ongoing and I think will allow us to, um, you know, as a full uh, committee, as a full EV working group, um, not only move forward with these specific recommendations, but to identify, you know, a, a, a way of defining success that will keep us on track going forward. Michael, you have something to add? Thanks, John. Um, yeah, one of the comments I think is one of the recommendations, I can't remember which one noted this well, like it was it was not a recommendation only to government. And I think um, in my sense, the spirit of the, the ZV working group, it brought together literally every stakeholder that, that kind of touches the EV market in some way. And um, I think we're making recommendations to that broad stakeholder group. So what are, you know, I like think, what are those critical things that have to happen and who needs to take those actions? It may be government, it may be private sector, maybe others. So um, thinking in that term, um, I think it is very helpful in kind of maybe as we as we hone in over the next coming months, kind of go back to that kind of core question of what are we are the most critical things we think need to happen in order to make sure the EV market is successful and then kind of make sure we're hitting those top ones in our recommendations. Thanks for that. Does anyone have um, anything to add along those lines or other pieces we haven't yet uh, brought up for today? Laura. Thanks. One question I have, and it may not be something to address today, but I wonder if the working group could maybe get a presentation, you know, and maybe I don't know, Michael or Rachel, if it's, it's within your shops of, I know there's a lot of investment from DOE into the grid, right? But if you look at, you know, what's happening right now in the Southeast of the country, right? And you look at the challenges we have with a you know a major storm, disaster recovery, loss of power, and the conversations we're all having about you know moving to an increasing electric transportation system, I think it could be helpful for the group to have a better understanding of the larger scale investments that are happening within the grid, right? You know, within our energy infrastructure to support that because I know there's a lot going on. But, you know, we're talking right now, and John's exactly right, like, you know, consumers say, how far will this car go, you know, and where can I charge it? And a negative experience really impacts perspective. And I think we need to be realistic that, you know, climate-related disasters and such contribute to that. So how can we understand the whole scope of how we're addressing this, this larger 
issue of energy availability and grid um, resiliency. That's something, yes, we can, uh, I think it, we can figure out the right way, the right time to kind of share some of that information on um, on those pieces that are happening. One, um, and, and the resiliency question overall, right, during times like this, you do, as you said, you, it makes you think of them a little bit more. The, um, there is, you know, maybe something we think about in our recommendations, right? Is there something they are, the resiliency of the network, resiliency of the charging, um, I, I, one thing to point out is during times when there's not electrical power, um, there's also not gas stations pumping gas either. So in some ways, there's right, we want to build as much resiliency. We want to make it better than the current system we have. You don't want to take a step backwards, but there are resiliency challenges during natural disasters, kind of in almost any way you're um, you're, you're fueling as well. But um, but that's something we can also think about, kind of how to build that into our recommendations. Nadia. I echo that. Uh, great point, Laura and, and Michael, con additional context. I know that is uh, something on the radar of the utilities and, and many others. So I think the timing is ripe. And uh, I know there is some really good work going on uh, on the government side and industry side. So uh, we'll definitely add that to the list. Thank you. And to Rachel's earlier point about process, does anyone have any questions on your next steps from um, the feedback from today and what you've been already starting to develop? Um, does everyone know what their uh, marching orders are to get us through the end of the calendar year through that timeline that Rachel shared um, through November and December? Are there any questions on that? Okay, um, let me ask Rachel, any questions you have for the group right now? Yeah, I just wanted to take the moment um, to uh, introduce my colleague, Scott Kubley. Um, so we have been working to staff up the joint office over uh, a number of, of months. Um, and we recently um, welcomed joint, uh, Welcome Scott Cooley to the joint office. Um, he is going to be working on partnerships and he has a great background in uh, the business side of, of all of this. So really excited to have him um, support the EV working group. Um, so Scott, I would love for you to give, give yourself a little introduction. Absolutely. Well, uh, it's been really great to, to join the joint office. I spent probably the first half to two thirds of my career in the public sector. So worked with Gabe as an executive in the DOT uh, in DC and then Chicago, and then moved over to Lime, uh, the scooter sharing company. Well, then ran the Seattle DOT uh, for several years. Uh, so learned at the, the feet of Gabe and then took what I learned to go run a, a big city DOT and then jumped over into the private sector and worked at Lime, uh, leading their government relations team uh, for a while, and then went off and joined my, or started my own company, uh, Cabana, which was a kind of a mobile hospitality kind of van sharing company. Along the way, like, as I, like, I'm having these EV memories kind of start flooding back to me. Uh, and so I kind of like, I was just thinking today on this call, like my, I remember my first EV ride was in the Ara days, uh, way back when I got to drive a Nissan Cube or a retrofitted Nissan Cube around Haynes Point in, in DC, if you've been there. And then uh, for folks that have been around DOT for a while, uh, Seattle, we put together a big electric bike sharing Tiger grant that was probably a year to two years ahead of its time. So we didn't, we didn't get it, but uh, we we all get to see kind of the magic of electric bike sharing now, which is pretty awesome. And then uh, also uh, had a chance to kind of see the first electric car sharing fleet in the U.S. and uh, Reach Now, which was BMW's uh, car sharing service. They had a bunch of i3s all over Seattle that we helped kind of get them get them permitted. And then when I was at, when I was at Lime, uh, I wound up uh, leading our uh, very promising 
but never realized EV car sharing effort, we wound up going with Fiat 500s because we didn't have enough uh, publicly available kind of ubiquitous electric vehicle charging. So uh, definitely get the, the need there. I did have a chance to drive almost every neighborhood electric vehicle on the market in the world uh, throughout the streets of Seattle and San Francisco. So I'm, I know that will make Gabe like a little bit jealous because I know he's a big NEV fan. And then lastly, when I was at Cabana, we tried very, very hard to figure out how to electrify our fleet of Ford Transits and Mercedes Sprinters. But sadly, our customers were driving a little bit too far. So about 250 miles a day instead of the 90 to 100 miles that that uh, they could accommodate at the time. So anyways, long story short, long history in transportation, lots of attempts at uh, electrifying fleets and really excited to be able to be a part of this now because I know with the, the money that uh, Congress approved and uh, FHWA and the joint office are putting out there that we will actually get there. Thank you. Michael, that was the, the Fiat 500 was the vehicle, the battery electric one was the one that we were trying to put out there. Uh, and we just didn't have enough uh, L2 charging or, or DC fast charging. At the time, this is, this is uh, seven years ago. So uh, we're much closer today. Thanks, Scott. Um, I, I love the experiences you share and it, you'll be um, really helpful as we work through our next steps with the working group. They are um, nothing if not eclectic. <laughs> Great. Uh, so before we turn over to our public comment um, portion of the meeting, I'd like to open up one more time. Um, are there any things that did not come up in um, the subcommittee recommendations that you'd like to inquire about or flag? You know, certainly um, there are lots of priorities and you have to go through that process to kind of pick and choose, you know, what are the ones to focus on with a, a finite amount of time. Um, so as you're figuring out your next steps, you know, having two strong focus areas is a great, a goal to move forward within each subcommittee, but we know that there's a lot of connections to be made and probably even building up out that scope a bit farther. So any, any other final thoughts from anyone that you'd like to share or support um, or ask questions on before we go to the next portion of our meeting? Michael. Um, I'll, uh... If Kofi is on, I'll put him on the spot here. Yes. Uh, uh, in just one to, to share that maybe our team will come back. We've been working on Kofi um, helped lead us in an exercise on our team to think about developing a set of KPIs. So the idea of basically kind of being a recommendation that um, collectively someone, we'll see who, whether it's government or others, should kind of basically be tracking the set of KPIs. And here is what are the top 15, 20, 30. We can think about how many there are. Um, to make sure we are all on track for um, for that different parts of the EV transition. So that's just another one that we were thinking that could come in. So we're, we're working towards that idea and Kofi started us with the first list and we've been working collectively to refine that over the last uh, month or so. Hopefully we'll have that for the team coming up soon. Don't know if we'll be in time for this round of recommendations, but maybe. Ditto, Michael. Um, yeah, we we're 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 working on that now, and um, we're working with the other subcommittees as well, including uh, John's, and uh, we hope to bring some recommendations to the group for discussion. Uh, up to you, Rachel. Um, when when to facilitate? When you think we could facilitate that over the next uh, two meetings that we've got, or next meeting that we've got scheduled, or the one after? So. Um, you know, we want to we want to be able to narrate. We want the KPIs to be able to talk about the progress we're making. We want to be transparent with the these indicators. There there are some indicators that are really important that we're realizing that we should be tracking, um, but not necessarily some. You know, all indicators need to be made public. So we're trying to for reasons that you know we may um, confuse the general public, they will be available, but not the ones that we would track at a frontline level, like say on a dashboard. So 
we're teasing out what metrics are going to help tell the story for how we arrive at accelerated adoption. But then we're also very serious about the, the other measures that help tell the story as to where we're performing and where we need to improve. Thanks for that update. That sounds great. Um, Michael, anything else you wanted to add? No. See the hand go down. So just take that as a no. Um, that was excellent. So anything else people would like to add? Okay, so we are just slightly ahead of schedule. So um, I'm going to move us to our next, the next portion of our meeting, which is the public comment period. So at this time, we're going to open up the meeting to hear from the public. For those members of the public joining us who would like to participate, please raise your hand if you'd like to make a comment. You can do this by raising your hand within the reactions icon. And each individual will have two minutes to share their comments. I will call your name. At that time, you can unmute yourself and turn your video on if you so choose. Um, if we're unable to get to everyone today, I'd just like to remind you that written statements can also be sent to the working group's email address, which is evwg at ee.doe.gov or via mail to Dr. Rachel Neeler, um, as described in the Federal Register Notice for this meeting. Any statements received by October 9th will be included in the meeting notes uh, to be posted to the website. So at this time, I'll look at my screen to see if there are any hands raised. Um, for those attending, please feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to give a comment. Okay, we have one hand raised so far. Um, Augustin Villarreal. You can unmute and turn your video on if you would like. All right. So there let me let me um let me get the little thing on. So I'm trying to get on, but I don't see like the little thing I'm trying to get. So I'll try and get uh like what's it called trying to get up. But it, but it keeps like trying to make me. It's okay. We can hear you. So why don't you begin with your comment, please? <laughs> Would you like to share your comment? Yes, I'm trying to get, but my camera's still not opening. Opening. It's up. okay. That's... We we can hear you. So that's fine. You can go ahead. Thank you. So today, my name's Augustin Barrio. For I'm advocating is for electric cars. What electric cars are doing is, you know, I'm advocating against electric cars because for me, what the electric cars are doing to our, our what's called planet is taking away jobs. For, for me, like the other day, I went to Herman Memorial Park and I found out that the um, there was electric train that's made, that was made electric. Like the trains at Memorial Herman and Tesla's every every car and train you see are made electric. So what they're doing to the planet is they are taking away jobs. It's destroying our planet. So what we need to do is try to do a little bit more, but not like what's called put bat. You know when when the cars run on fuel, they uh they blow up each time. So what we need to do for our country, for this planet, is to help more, understand more about the electric cars and understand it more. See, what can we do to not make sure, to make sure, hey, we can make sure to help the environment out, the planet, help do, help do a lot more and help with cars and stuff in America. So it doesn't have to be more, what's called more blowing up so we can do more. For what I want to do is work with organizations to do a lot more to make sure that electric cars get more help. We don't, we don't, what's called, and for the make sure, make sure the next 10 years, five years, we make sure to get these electric cars ready and going on the roads, but we make sure to not, what's called, make them explode at all. We need to do 
we need to make sure it's safer, but not like be what's cost. So we be we gotta be cautious about. We gotta be more cautious about what's what's gonna happen with these cars and stuff. We wanna make sure. What can we do to do our part? To do, to make sure. Hey, like if these Augustine, cars get on spot. Yes. Yep. Thank you for your comment. We are at two minutes, so I'm going to to ask Thanks. that Thanks. that we stop. But we appreciate your comments Thank you. today. Thank you. Okay, we have another hand raised. Um, I'd like to call on Cassandra Dume. Is my audio working? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, so I'm Cassandra. I'm from Politico. I just have a quick question for Mike Roweth or anybody on the subcommittee for medium to heavy duty vehicles. Um, are there any kind of, or what are the myths specifically that you guys are kind of hoping to address, with, which is what I think was your first um, recommendation? Are there any examples of information that you guys are hoping to clear up to move forward um, with kind of expanding EVs? So sure. Cassandra... I'm just going to stop us here for a second, just to clarify, this public comment period is for um, comments to be made, but the working group members will not be answering any questions. Certainly, um, the EV working group email address can also collect um, other requests. Yeah, and I'll just add, Rachel, if you don't mind, um, Cassandra, just stay tuned because we're going to publicly post uh, some work from the medium and heavy duty uh, working group subcommittee um, anyways. So uh, we hope to have something to share with you and all of the public very soon. Thanks. Okay, keep an eye out. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, at this time, are there any other members of the public who would like to provide a comment? Okay, seeing none, um, this will conclude the portion of our public comment period. I'm going to now turn it back over to Rachel Neeler. Uh, Rachel, you can walk us through some of the next steps and we can discuss the scheduling for the next working group meeting. Awesome, thank you so much, Rachel. All right, so um, we are now um, headed towards, I think, a uh, pretty robust uh, next set of months for the EV working group. So um, just want to make sure that everyone's participating in the subcommittees, but also these uh, these um, full membership groups as meetings as well. Um, we are very excited to hear from the subcommittees on uh, what they want to propose to vote on for the recommendations for the full committee. Um, and that's really kind of our, our next steps here. So very happy to uh, talk about next steps. And uh, I think our next meeting will be proposed around that voting. Um, so it'll be a series of, of virtual meetings uh, that will be uh, focused on getting some of those recommendations approved into the public on our website. Um, the other proposed meeting is an in-person meeting in December where we will also uh, kind of take a look back at the year that we had as the EV working group and start thinking about the next year to come. Um, so we will at that point, uh, depending on the timing, we'll likely have voted on the, the approved recommendations, uh, but we will also uh, be posting those publicly around that time. Um, and then we can think about what recommendations we wanna tackle next, but then also as we talked about, what are some of the actions around the recommendations that have already been approved? What does the EV working group want to substanti substantively dig into? Um, and let's identify some uh, stakeholders that we'd wanna work with on those. So those are kind of the, the next steps proposed. Um, I also heard that um, you know, doing some presentation or report out of the KPI across the subcommittees would also be something uh, valuable for the EV working group and for the public to hear as well. So I think we can also uh, work towards scheduling that as well. Any questions? Rachel, there are a few comments in the chat just looking to pin down um, any December meeting for scheduling purposes. 
Yep. So we are already working on a poll to send around to folks. It will be before the holidays. In fact, our work plan uh, tried to take into consideration some holiday slowdowns um, so that uh, we could still meet our goals by the end of the year uh, without, uh, you know, asking for volunteer time um, during some uh, otherwise pretty busy, busy times for folks, both uh, in, in the work sense and in the personal sense. So we will have uh, more information then, but it, it should be in uh, the first half of December. And we are expecting to, uh, I think, hold that in, in DC. Were there other, I'm sorry, I don't see the chat, Rachel, were there other questions? Um, no, just a few folks looking for that December date. Um, yep. And J Julie did note the poll was sent out for the December meeting. So we're just yep. working to finalize it. Fantastic. No all other right. Questions. Well, then with that, thank you all so much for your time. Um, really excited to see what the subcommittees uh, put forth as recommendations and that we can share that soon with the public, both in the voting, but also in, in the uh, public website that we'll have to share all these recommendations. Thank you so much, folks. Thank you, everyone.